This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the North American Review, March 15, 1907, Chapters from My Autobiography, Chapter 14, by Mark Twain. Dictated Thursday, December 6, 1906. From Susie's Biography of Me, February 27, Sunday. Clara's reputation as a baby was always a fine one, mine exactly the contrary. One often related story concerning her braveness as a baby and her own opinion of this quality of hers is this. Clara and I often got slivers in our hands, and when Mama took them out with a much-dreaded needle, Clara was always very brave, and I very cowardly. One day Clara got one of these slivers in her hand, a very bad one, and while Mama was taking it out, Clara stood perfectly still, without even wincing. I saw how brave she was, and turning to Mama, said, "'Mama, isn't she a brave little thing?' Presently Mama had to give the little hand quite a dig with the needle, and noticing how perfectly quiet Clara was about it, she exclaimed, "'Why, Clara, you are a brave little thing!' Clara responded, "'Nobody braver but God!' Clara's pious remark is the main detail, and Susie has accurately remembered its phrasing. The three-year-old's wound was of a formidable sort, and not one which the mother's surgery would have been equal to. The flesh of the finger had been burst by a cruel accident. It was the doctor that sewed it up, and to all appearances it was he, and the other independent witnesses, that did the main part of the suffering. Each stitch that he took made Clara wince slightly, but it shriveled the others. I take pride in Clara's remark, because it shows that although she was only three years old, her fireside teachings were already making her a thinker a thinker and also an observer of proportions. I am not claiming any credit for this. I furnished the children worldly knowledge and wisdom, but was not competent to go higher, and so I left their spiritual education in the hands of the mother. A result of this modesty of mine was made manifest to me in a very striking way some years afterward, when Jean was nine years old. We had recently arrived in Berlin, at the time, and had begun housekeeping in a furnished apartment. One morning at breakfast a vast card arrived, an invitation. To be precise, it was a command from the Emperor of Germany to come to dinner. During several months I had encountered socially on the continent men bearing lofty titles, and all this while Jean was becoming more and more impressed and awed and subdued by these imposing events, for she had not been abroad before and they were new to her. Wonders out of dreamland turned into realities. The imperial card was passed from hand to hand around the table, and examined with interest. When it reached Jean, she exhibited excitement and emotion, but for a time was quite speechless. Then she said, "'Why, Papa, if it keeps going on like this, pretty soon there won't be anybody left for you to get acquainted with but God.' It was not complimentary to think I was not acquainted in that quarter, but she was young, and the young jumped to conclusions without reflection. Necessarily I did myself the honor to obey the command of the Emperor Wilhelm II. Princess Heinrich and six or eight other guests were present. The Emperor did most of the talking, and he talked well, and in faultless English. In both of these conspicuousnesses I was gratified to recognize a resemblance to myself a very exact resemblance. No, almost exact, but not quite that. A modified exactness, with the advantage in favor of the Emperor. My English, like his, is nearly faultless. Like him I talk well. And when I have guests at dinner, I prefer to do all the talking myself. It is the best way, and the pleasantest. Also the most profitable for the others. I was greatly pleased to perceive that His Majesty was familiar with my books and that his attitude toward them was not uncomplimentary. In the course of his talk he said that my best and most valuable book was Old Times on the Mississippi. I will refer to that remark again, presently. 
an official who was well up in the foreign office at that time and had served under bismarck for fourteen years was still occupying his old place under chancellor caprivi smith i will call him of whom i am speaking though that is not his name he was a special friend of mine and i greatly enjoyed his society although in order to have it it was necessary for me to seek it as late as midnight and not earlier this was because government officials of his rank had to work all day after nine in the morning and then attend official banquets in the evening wherefore they were usually unable to get life-restoring fresh air and exercise for their jaded minds and bodies earlier than midnight then they turned out in groups of two or three and gratefully and violently tramped the deserted streets until two in the morning smith had been in the government service at home and abroad for more than thirty years and he was now sixty years old or close upon it he could not remember a year in which he had had a vacation of more than a fortnight's length he was weary all through to the bones and the marrow now and was yearning for a holiday of a whole three months yearning so longingly and so poignantly that he had at last made up his mind to make a desperate cast for it and stand the consequences whatever they might be it was against all rules to ask for a vacation quite against all etiquette the shock of it would paralyze the chancellery stern etiquette and usage required another form the applicant was not privileged to ask for a vacation he must send in his resignation the chancellor would know that the applicant was not really trying to resign and didn't want to resign but was merely trying in his left-handed way to get a vacation the night before the emperor's dinner i helped smith take his exercise after midnight and he was full of his project he had sent in his resignation that day and was trembling for the result and naturally because it might possibly be that the chancellor would be happy to fill his place with somebody else in which case he could accept the resignation without comment and without offence smith was in a very anxious frame of mind not that he feared that caprivi was dissatisfied with him for he had no such fear it was the emperor that he was afraid of he did not know how he stood with the emperor he said that while apparently it was caprivi who would decide his case it was in reality the emperor who would perform that service that the emperor kept personal watch upon everything and that no official sparrow could fall to the ground without his privity and consent that the resignation would be laid before his majesty who would accept it or decline to accept it according to his pleasure and that then his pleasure in the matter would be communicated by caprivi smith said he would know his fate the next evening after the imperial dinner that when i should escort his majesty into the large salon contiguous to the dining-room i would find there about thirty men cabinet ministers admirals generals and other great officials of the empire and that these men would be standing talking together in little separate groups of two or three persons that the emperor would move from group to group and say a word to each sometimes two words sometimes ten words and that the length of his speech whether brief or not so brief would indicate the exact standing in the emperor's regard of the man accosted and that by observing this thermometer an expert could tell to half a degree the state of the imperial weather in each case that in berlin as in the imperial days of rome the emperor was the sun and that his smile or his frown meant good fortune or disaster to the man upon whom it should fall smith suggested that i watch the thermometer while the emperor went his rounds of the groups and added that if his majesty talked four minutes with any person there present it meant high favor and that the sun was in the zenith and cloudless for that man i mentally recorded that four-minute altitude and resolved to see if any man there on that night stood in sufficient favor to achieve it very well after the dinner i watched the emperor while he passed from group to group and privately i timed him with a watch two or three times he came near to reaching the four-minute altitude but always he fell short a little the last man he came to was smith he put his hand on smith's shoulder and began to talk to him and when he finished the thermometer had scored seven minutes the company then moved towards the smoking-room where cigars beer and anecdotes would be in brisk service until midnight and as smith passed me he whispered 
That settles it. The Chancellor will ask me how much of a vacation I want, and I shan't be afraid to raise the limit. I shall call for six months." Smith's dream had been to spend his three months' vacation, in case he got a vacation instead of the other thing, in one of the great capitals of the continent, a capital whose name I shall suppress at present. The next day the Chancellor asked him how much of a vacation he wanted, and where he desired to spend it. Smith told him. His prayer was granted, and rather more than granted. The Chancellor augmented his salary and attached him to the German embassy of that selected capital, giving him a place of high dignity bearing an imposing title, and with nothing to do except attend banquets of an extraordinary character at the embassy once or twice a year. The term of his vacation was not specified. He was to continue it until requested to come back to his work in the Foreign Office. This was in 1891. Eight years later Smith was passing through Vienna, and he called upon me. There had been no interruption of his vacation, as yet, and there was no likelihood that an interruption of it would occur while he should still be among the living. Dictated Monday, December 17, 1906 as I have already remarked, old times on the Mississippi got the Kaiser's best praise. It was after midnight when I reached home. I was usually out until toward midnight, and the pleasure of being out late was poisoned every night by the dread of what I must meet at my front door. An indignant face, a resentful face, the face of the portier. The portier was a tow-headed young German, twenty-two or twenty-three years old, and it had been for some time apparent to me that he did not enjoy being hammered out of his sleep nights to let me in. He never had a kind word for me, nor a pleasant look. I couldn't understand it, since it was his business to be on watch and let the occupants of the several flats in at any and all hours of the night. I could not see why he so distinctly failed to get reconciled to it. The fact is, I was ignorantly violating every night a custom in which he was commercially interested. I did not suspect this. No one had told me of the custom, and if I had been left to guess it, it would have taken me a very long time to make a success of it. It was a custom which was so well established and so universally recognized that it had all the force and dignity of law. By authority of this custom, whosoever entered a Berlin house after ten at night must pay a trifling toll to the portier for breaking his sleep to let him in. This tax was either two and a half cents or five cents, I don't remember which, but I had never paid it, and didn't know I owed it, and as I had been residing in Berlin several weeks, I was so far in arrears that my presence in the German capital was getting to be a serious disaster to that young fellow. I arrived from the imperial dinner sorrowful and anxious, made my presence known, and prepared myself to wait in patience the tedious minute or two which the portier usually allowed himself to keep me tarrying as a punishment. But this time there was no stage wait. The door was instantly unlocked, unbolted, unchained, and flung wide, and in it appeared the strange and welcome apparition of the portier's round face, all sunshine and smiles and welcome in place of the black frowns and hostility that I was expecting. Plainly he had not come out of his bed. He had been waiting for me, watching for me. He began to pour out upon me, in the most enthusiastic and energetic way, a generous stream of German welcome and homage, meanwhile dragging me excitedly to his small bedroom beside the front door. There he made me bend down over a row of German translations of my books, and said, "'There! You wrote them!' I found it out. By God, I did not know it before, and I ask a million pardons. That one there, The Old Times on the Mississippi, is the best book you ever wrote. The usual number of those curious accidents which we call coincidences have fallen to my share in this life, but for picturesqueness this one puts all the others in the shade, that a crowned head and a portier, the very top of an empire and the very bottom of it, should pass the very same criticism and deliver the very same verdict upon a book of mine, and almost in the same hour and the same breath, is a coincidence which out-coincides any coincidence which I could have imagined with such powers of imagination as I have been favoured with, and I have not been accustomed to regard them as being small or of an inferior quality. It is always a satisfaction to me to remember that whereas I do not know, for sure, 
what any other nation thinks of any one of my twenty-three volumes, I do at least know for a certainty what one nation of fifty million thinks of one of them at any rate. For if the mutual verdict of the top of an empire and the bottom of it does not establish for good and all the judgment of the entire nation concerning that book, then the axiom that we can get a sure estimate of a thing by arriving at a general average of all the opinions involved is a fallacy. Dictated Monday, February 10, 1907. Two months ago, December 6th, I was dictating a brief account of a private dinner in Berlin where the Emperor of Germany was host and I the chief guest. Something happened day before yesterday which moves me to take up that matter again. At the dinner His Majesty chatted briskly and entertainingly along in easy and flowing English, and now and then he interrupted himself to address a remark to me, or to some other individual of the guests. When the reply had been delivered, he resumed his talk. I noticed that the table etiquette tallied with that which was the law of my house at home when we had guests. That is to say, the guests answered when the host favored them with a remark, and then quieted down and behaved themselves until they got another chance. If I had been in the Emperor's chair and he in mine, I should have felt infinitely comfortable and at home, and should have done a world of talking, and done it well. But I was a guest now, and consequently I felt less at home. From old experience I was familiar with the rules of the game, and familiar with their exercise from the high place of host, but I was not familiar with the trammelled and less satisfactory position of guest. Therefore I felt a little strange and out of place. But there was no animosity. No, the Emperor was host. Therefore, according to my own rule, he had a right to do the talking, and it was my honourable duty to intrude no interruptions or other improvements except upon invitation. And, of course, it could be my turn some day, some day on some friendly visit of inspection to America. It might be my pleasure and distinction to have him as guest at my table. Then I would give him a rest and a remarkably quiet time. In one way there was a difference between his table and mine. For instance, atmosphere. The guests stood in awe of him, and naturally they conferred that feeling upon me, for, after all, I am only human, although I regret it. When a guest answered a question, he did it with differential voice and manner. He did not put any emotion into it, and he did not spin it out, but got it out of his system as quickly as he could, and then looked relieved. The Emperor was used to this atmosphere, and it did not chill his blood. Maybe it was an inspiration to him, for he was alert, brilliant, and full of animation. Also he was most graceful and felicitously complimentary to my books. And I will remark here that the happy phrasing of a compliment is one of the rarest of human gifts, and the happy delivery of it another. In that other chapter I mentioned the high compliment which he paid to the book Old Times on the Mississippi, but there were others, among them some gratifying praise of my description in A Tramp Abroad, of certain striking phases of German student life. I mention these things here, because I shall have occasion to hark back to them presently. Dictated Tuesday, February 12, 1907 Those stars, just above, indicate the long chapter which I dictated yesterday, a chapter which is much too long for magazine purposes, and therefore must wait until this autobiography shall appear in book form, five years hence, when I am dead, five years according to my calculation, twenty-seven years, according to the prediction furnished me a week ago, by the latest and most confident of all the palmists who have ever read my future in my hand. The Emperor's dinner, and its beer and anecdote appendix, covered six hours of diligent industry, and this accounts for the extraordinary length of that chapter. A couple of days ago a gentleman called upon me with a message. He had just arrived from Berlin, where he had been acting for our government in a manner concerning tariff revision he being a member of the commission appointed by our government to conduct our share of the affair. Upon the completion of the commission's labors, the Emperor invited the members of it to an audience, and in the course of the conversation he made a reference to me. Continuing, he spoke of my chapter on the German language in A Tramp Abroad, and characterized it by an adjective which is too complimentary for me to repeat here without bringing my modesty under suspicion. 
Then he paid some compliments to The Innocents Abroad, and followed these with the remark that my account in one of my books of certain striking phases of German student life was the best and truest that has ever been written. By this I perceive that he remembers that dinner of sixteen years ago, for he said the same thing to me about the student chapter at that time. Next he said he wished this gentleman to convey two messages to America from him and deliver them, one to the President, the other to me. The wording of the message to me was, Convey to Mr. Clemens my kindest regards, ask him if he remembers that dinner, and ask him why he didn't do any talking. Why, how could I talk when he was talking? He held the age, as the poker clergy say, and two can't talk at the same time with good effect. It reminds me of the man who was reproached by a friend who said, I think it a shame that you have not spoken to your wife for fifteen years. How do you explain it? How do you justify it? That poor man said, I didn't want to interrupt her. If the emperor had been at my table, he would not have suffered from my silence. He would only have suffered from the sorrows of his own solitude. If I were not too old to travel, I would go to Berlin and introduce the etiquette of my own table, which tallies with the etiquette observable at the other royal tables. I would say, Invite me again, Your Majesty, and give me a chance. Then I would courteously waive rank and do all the talking myself. I thank His Majesty for his kind message, and am proud to have it, and glad to express my sincere reciprocation of its sentiments. Dictated January 17, 1906 Reverend Joseph T. Harris and I have been visiting General Sickles. Once, twenty or twenty-five years ago, just as Harris was coming out of his gate Sunday morning to walk to his church and preach, a telegram was put into his hand. He read it immediately, and then, in a manner, collapsed. It said, General Sickles died last night at midnight. He had been a chaplain under Sickles through the war. It wasn't so, but no matter, it was so to Harris at the time. He walked along, walked to the church, but his mind was far away. All his affection and homage and worship of his general had come to the fore. His heart was full of these emotions. He hardly knew where he was. In his pulpit he stood up and began the service, but with a voice over which he had almost no command. The congregation had never seen him thus moved before in his pulpit. They sat there and gazed at him and wondered what was the matter because he was now reading, in this broken voice, and with occasional tears trickling down his face, what to them seemed a quite unemotional chapter, that one about Moses begat Aaron, and Aaron begat Deuteronomy, and, and Deuteronomy begat St. Peter, and St. Peter begat Cain, and Cain begat Abel, and he was going along with this, and half crying, his voice continually breaking. The congregation left the church that morning without being able to account for this most extraordinary thing, as it seemed to them, that a man who had been a soldier for more than four years, and who had preached in that pulpit so many, many times on really moving subjects, without even the quiver of a lip, should break all down over the begats they couldn't understand. But there it is. Any one can see how much a mystery as that would arouse the curiosity of those people to the boiling point. Harris had had many adventures. He has more adventures in a year than anybody else has in five. One Saturday night he noticed a bottle on his uncle's dressing bureau. He thought the label said, Hair Restorer, and he took it in his room and gave his head a good drenching and sousing with it, and carried it back and thought no more about it. Next morning when he got up, his head was a bright green. He sent around everywhere, and couldn't get a substitute preacher, so he had to go to his church himself and preach, and he did. He hadn't a sermon in his barrel, as it happened, of any lightsome character, so he had to preach a very grave one, a very serious one, and it made the matter worse. The gravity of the sermon did not harmonize with the gaiety of his head, and the people sat all through it with handkerchiefs stuffed in their mouths to try to keep down their joy and Harris told me that he was sure he had never seen his congregation, the whole body of his congregation, the entire body of his congregation, absorbed in interest in his sermon from beginning to end before. Always there had been an aspect of indifference here and there, or wandering somewhere, but this time there was nothing of the kind. Those people sat there as if they thought, 
good for this day and train only. We must have all there is of this show, not waste any of it." And he said that, when he came down out of the pulpit, more people waited to shake him by the hand and tell him what a good sermon it was than ever before. And it seemed a pity that these people should do these fictions in such a place, right in the church, when it was quite plain they were not interested in the sermon at all. They only wanted to get a near view of his head. Well, Harris said, no, Harris didn't say, I say, that as the days went on and Sunday followed Sunday, the interest in Harris's hair grew and grew, because it didn't stay merely and monotonously green, it took on deeper and deeper shades of green, and then it would change and become reddish, and would go from that to some other color, purplish, yellowish, bluish, and so on. But it was never a solid color. It was always mottled and each Sunday it was a little more interesting than it was the Sunday before. And Harris's head became famous, and people came from New York and Boston and South Carolina and Japan and so on, to look. There wasn't seating capacity for all the people that came while his head was undergoing these various and fascinating mottlings, and it was a good thing in several ways, because the business had been languishing a little, and now a lot of people joined the church so that they could have the show and it was the beginning of a prosperity for that church which has never diminished in all these years. Mark Twain. To be continued.